The Red Cross and emergency services management are on the scene and they're taking care of the situation, but the first people to greet those evacuated were just good Samaritans. Now it was right here that she saw something suspicious, something out of the ordinary and something that she knew just wasn't right. Stop lights at each of the intersections have these cameras that are mounted on them. Now let's give you a better look at what they actually look like if we zoom in here. These cameras. It's the first day of a new year here in Pasco and one of those choices has already cost someone a life. Let me show you what it looks like from uh, my point of view. Mud being kicked up around here. Uh, it's getting messy. It smells like gasoline. When the family found a noose here hanging in the garage, the marks on his neck started to make sense. Lights being designed lower and lower to the ground. You know that it's for a safe reason. We're live in Kennewick tonight. Don Granice, NBC Right Now. Roy Rosales sent me this message back in September with his concerns. He believed local veterans were being turned away from emergency funding that they needed, and he was one of them. After months of research, digging through paperwork, and bringing these concerns to the attention of Benton County officials, we found a problem that could hurt men and women who fought for our country. It really boggled my mind, and it made me feel uh, a little bit uh, unworthy. Why am I being denied such a simple service? A simple service, but one that he needed at that time. It all started here at the Kennewick VFW. You submit an application and you either get the funding or you don't. Or in this case, those tax dollars don't get put to use in a way they're intended to. When I asked him why am I denied these benefits, I told him I have an honorable discharge. And they said it's because I did not meet my initial military obligation. Rosales was only one month shy of his four years of service before his commanding officer released him. His obligation ended there. The state of Washington legally defines a veteran with multiple definitions. You either meet one or the other and you're a veteran. But that's not how it worked in Benton County. Fellow veterans stating that they were following rules and regulations. But the wrong way. Pat Powell has led the Veterans Advisory Board for years, and he even wrote a letter to a Washington legislator when he questioned the law. He thought a veteran had to meet both legal definitions. He also thought the honorable discharge didn't warrant what he called entitlement. Sorry, you're not eligible because this is how we interpret the RCW. How can someone sit there especially another veteran say, sorry, Mr. Veteran, you're not qualified. Now, these people on this Veterans Advisory Board, they're just citizens. That's correct, but that's why we have them to um, advise us on you know, what the decision is, and we take that advice very seriously, and if they feel that someone doesn't qualify, then we usually take that advice and move forward with that. What if they were wrong in this case? If they were wrong in this case, then we would make every effort to rectify that. Rosales had used the fund back in 2010. He had no issues. So when he applied again this past September, why the sudden change? It's a good question. If someone was served in the past that was not eligible now, then that must have been in error um, in the past. And that's you know really all I can say about it. So you think it was an error in the past and not an error currently? Mm-hmm. Rosales decided he wanted to appeal the decision, not just for himself, but for a number of other local veterans who could be in the same boat. How long and how much more do other veterans like myself who are being, let's say, discriminated against or choosing from are going to suffer when we are in need. Benton County commissioners recently heard both sides at a special hearing and after noticing the mistakes made, granted Rosales his appeal. A veteran is a veteran in my eyes. Doesn't matter if he lives in a mansion or he lives in a cardboard box. We all served. There's a brotherhood and we need to respect that. Because of his appeal and the concerns that he brought up, the county will change their policy and the way they deal with the Veteran Relief Fund, making sure that the money gets to the right people. In the studio, Don Granice, NBC Right Now. While I was standing there trying to talk to him, uh, he was pointing his gun at me and uh, his finger was on the trigger his hands were shaking, um, and I've never experienced anything like that before in my life. I, I thought that day I was going to die. It was a warm July evening when then off-duty Deputy Erickson came across his neighbors, Leo Garcia, Rick Howard, and Howard's wife Vicki, in what appeared to be an argument. His six-year-old and four-year-old daughters were with him, coming outside to play in their quiet Pasco neighborhood. They had no idea what was going on, 
And that really scared me because I thought either they were going to see me die or they were going to die or they're going to see Rick die. Erickson quickly noticed Howard was inebriated, possibly suicidal, with multiple guns out on his front porch. He was a danger and his kids were walking right into it. So I turned back to Rick and I, I plead with Rick basically that I know you wouldn't want to hurt my children. You love my children. You know, accidents happen. Your gun could go off. Um, you know, please put the gun down. He tells me that if I come back outside with any of my guns that he would shoot and kill me. So he brings the kids inside. Knowing Leo and Vicky are still out there seeking cover, it's time for serious help. Can you have County 16 respond to my residence? emergency. Erickson, who's now watching the situation from his first floor window, grabs his gun. As he's on the phone with emergency dispatch, he hears a shot from inside the Howard's home. He starts to lift the gun up and point it in at Leo. And I thought that he was going to, to shoot Leo at that time. And so um, I, I took my gun and I uh, punched it through the screen and uh, started shooting at Rick. Shot fired. The deputy shots weren't fatal. They sprayed Howard's porch and forced him back inside. Leo, lay on the ground. But Leo was still out there in the street. Using his portable radio, Erickson communicated with the SWAT team now on the scene and helped guide them to extract Leo from behind a car and Vicki, who had been in a neighbor's yard. I'm grateful that we were protected, that everyone's safe. Um, and it really just aligned our priorities and just kind of reminded us that that family is um, important. It's something that fueled many of Erickson's decisions that day, family, protecting them and his neighbor's lives. But it still came with a tragic end. It was a very difficult day. Um, I, I thought I was gonna die. And I thought Leo was gonna die. And I thought my kids were gonna die. When Howard was eventually shot and killed by officers that night, Erickson knew he wouldn't be saving everyone that day. There's nothing else like it. Um, after you're involved in a shooting, um, you feel uh, very alone. Um, and that's scary um, because I have a wife and kids and I have a house. And I know that when I put this uniform on every day, um, I potentially put that at risk. But it's taking that risk sometimes, even when the badge isn't on, that makes Jason Erickson a Red Cross real hero. Don Grenice, NBC Right Now. <laughs> What do I do? Uh, what's going on? Um, where do I go? Um, oh, my friends are okay. What is this? It was unbelievable. And changed their lives. Darius Griffith, Susan Brain, and Judy Bell didn't finish last year's Boston Marathon. In a way, these Tri-Cities women were glad they ran the pace they did. From me being late to the finish line, to me uh, walking at every water stop. Every step she took and every step she didn't take led to today. I started walking because my legs started hurting and I was just really tired. And I knew that uh, when I saw the video that I could have been there and I wasn't. It wasn't meant for me to be there. It was just like jello had been poured down the course and everybody just kind of slowed down and stopped. Susan started texting her friend Judy, but Judy left her phone with her husband. My first thought was that for my husband, he was at the finish line waiting for me. But safe. He said the images he had seen were unimaginable. Somehow in the middle of all of that chaos, Judy and her husband found each other. We embraced. <laughs> Thank God. For each of them, this Marathon Monday is an unforgettable life moment. My intention in Boston this year is to really pay attention to the present moment. It's it's a gift. And this year, they say nothing is stopping them from that finish line. It's their way to remember those lost and honor the injured just a mile away from them. Every mile is an emotional marker. It's going to be an amazing celebration and healing time for us that, you know, we deserve. You wonder why you couldn't have gone faster and then you think, was there a purpose in this? Our job is to go back and finish for them because that completes the circle.